I'm Rundy, I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to be having a conversation about exercising American soft power through international education and leadership exchange. Um, we have three really thoughtful people who I think are going to be able to help us um, unpack this important conversation. Um, international education and leadership exchange uh, were concepts that I think largely evolved out of the Cold War but are very relevant today. And I think we're gonna have a chance to, to talk about this in a number of different ways. So um, I think you each, I think you have their biographies in front of you, if, and I'm not gonna go into long detailed descriptions of, of, each of each of my colleagues here, but I think, because um, I think many of you know them. So Ambassador Stuart Holliday is the President CEO of the Meridian International Center. I'm gonna start with you, Ambassador Holliday. So could you talk a little bit about how did the Meridian International Center get started? What, what is the Meridian International Center? How to get started and how has it evolved since? And I'll ask each of you, my colleagues to, to describe that. Thank you, Dan. And it's great to be here with uh, Kristen and, and Lauren, who I've known for a long time and are great uh, colleagues, uh, run terrific organizations. Meridian was created in 1960, really um, as a sort of a a gateway to America for all the sort of international exchange programs. Originally, I think people thought that you could just come to the United States and go to Kansas or California and that would be enough, but there was a realization by um, the State Department and others that there needed to be really a, a place to orient these people who were coming here on exchange programs about our society, about our system, about federalism, all these different kinds of things. And by the way, I see there are a number of people in the audience who could probably teach this uh, you know, soft power course. But uh, Meridian began doing leadership exchanges, uh, over 150 heads of state, members of parliament, uh, cabinet members, others, and the, the political um, uh, construct was sort of the, the first and most important um, group of leaders that uh, originally were brought to the United States on these programs. Over the last two decades, that's shifted in large part to include other important stakeholders in civil society, uh, entrepreneurs, a, a variety of other people, but all of them have one thing in common, which is they can go back to their countries and they have either the ability to uh, be people who can explain the United States, be an ally, or be influential in that society. And throughout the years, Meridian also developed two other uh, important functions. Uh, one is as a convener, a neutral convener without an agenda, basically bringing U.S. and inter international leaders, the diplomatic corps, the private sector, the government together to look at where there may be gaps in perception between the U.S. position and the other position. So in effect, it's sort of an accelerated, collaborative, uh, convening function that we, that we play. Um, and then the third is cultural diplomacy. So we create, uh, you all, of course, many of you, some of you worked for the U.S. Information Agency. We actually create cultural exhibitions and art initiatives uh, that travel around the world uh, and are uh, used by the U.S. embassies to, to reach and engage international publics, and we also do the same thing with international uh, embassies here. And so um, we have about uh, 100 staff located up here on 16th Street and some beautiful John Russell Pope uh, mansions, which, which some of you may have visited. Um, and uh, most of our staff are really committed to the idea that we can solve uh, our challenges more effectively if we work with people who share them from other countries. And I'd like to end by saying that, you know, I think going forward, two things are really important. One is to actually, and I know uh, Kirsten has done this as well, which is to keep these leaders engaged in networks. It shouldn't be that they go home and that's it. It should be that this is now a community of interests of Americans and international participants that can continue to stay engaged and continue to work together and be in contact because the more mistrust there are in traditional institutions and in governments, the more individual groups of leaders, professionals and students, networks of people working together are gonna to be vital. And the, the last thing I would say is that the value really is, uh, these are the programs that our ambassadors have said are their preferred and most effective programs in terms of their impact on the ground. And uh, that's why uh, 
the Congress has been wonderful. People like uh, Senator Corker and Congressman Royce. Uh, Marie Royce, who's our Assistant Secretary, served on my board for six years and is a ter terrific advocate for exchanges, so delighted to be here. Okay, Stuart. You know, that's wonderful. You know, the only reason I invite you is I want to, when am I getting a, an invite to the Meridian Ball? That's all I want to know. That's right. Well, <laughs> make sure to put one in the put me on Put me on the list. But, but let, me just, let me just push Ambassador Holly just, just on this issue of the strategic value of this. I think you, you've laid out a number of arguments about the strategic value of what, what you do. Could you tell a story of either a group that you've had from, let's call it a geostrategic country where you thought, this was really important that this group came here or that, that, that they understood something that if they hadn't been here, or they hadn't been facilitated through Meridian, you know, that this, you know, there'd have been a, either a, misunder, a misunderstanding or that this was the sort of thing that we needed to be doing. Sure, I'll tell a couple of stories. I think, um, first of all, it's very hard to sort of pinpoint one activity and say that it had an overwhelming impact on uh, the trajectory of relationship because as you know there's so many things that affect but I would say that there was a week in uh, 2006 or so maybe eight that uh, Vice President Cheney was on the deck of the USS uh, Eisenhower in the Persian Gulf talking about um, and I worked for him and have great respect for him but uh, he was talking about uh, a very aggressive um, uh, stance against Iran and uh, that same week we brought over uh, 20 Iranian artists to Meridian and we had Secretary Rice uh, come over and meet with them and engage with them and, and express admiration for Persian culture. Um, that actually played uh, extensively in the media back in Iran and I think it was an example of how you can have a foreign policy that's nuanced where uh, you're expressing and showing respect for the culture and the history of a country while you may be making other statements in terms of your foreign policy or security objectives. Another you know, example would be in the last couple of weeks, we run programs for staff from the Korean parliament and the Japanese parliament uh, to come here and work, uh, basically be embedded in our legislature and then we send staff over to those countries. Um, I can only imagine uh, how those people um, are benefiting and benefiting us in terms of providing input and perspective as we deal with some of the critical issues we're talking about right now in, in, uh, in Asia and how it helps us understand each other more effectively. And again, those programs all have 20 to 30 years of alumni who have come through them and they are continuing to work in policy positions and it gives them a better understanding when something happens or something uh, is said to put it in context and to help uh, bridge those differences. Thanks a lot. Okay. So Kristen Lord, you're the President and CEO of IREX. Thanks for being here. Could you tell a little bit of the origin story of IREX and talk a, lot, a little bit about the evolution of the organization over time? Absolutely, and thanks very much, Dan, and all of you for being here. Uh, first of all, please join me in, welcome, in wishing IREX a very happy 50th birthday. Yay. Yeah. July 1 marks 50 years since IREX was created as a result of a public-private partnership in order to promote strategic U.S. interests as well as mutual understanding between the U.S. and the Soviet bloc. We were actually started at Columbia University. We were started by universities and foundations like the Ford Foundation and Carnegie who really wanted to find ways to promote the exchange of people and ideas with the Soviet bloc at a time of very high global tension. And indeed, we were tested early on. So we were started on July 1st of 1968. And if I, history, uh, if I remember history correctly, August 19th was Prague Spring. And immediately, there were calls to end all exchanges with the Soviet bloc. Even IREX's board of governors was leaving in that leading in that direction. But our president, uh, Alan Kassoff, who's still up at Princeton and a wonderful, active person, um, he said, no, when things get hot, this is when you need the exchange of people and ideas even more. And so IREX persisted through that entire time, and indeed, for, for many decades to come. And I think that's a great lesson. 
In terms of where we are today, let me take a brief stop at the end of the Cold War. IREX was really focused exclusively on exchanging scholars, researchers, students, and ideas uh, between the US and the Soviet bloc until the end of the Cold War, at which point IREX, with its vast relationships in the region, moved to a broader range of what I'll call human development objectives. We were helping to form independent civil society, to promote independent media, to promote education reform, and to help cultivate the leaders who would be uh, the leaders in these newly free societies. So with the State Department, we were very proud, for instance, to run the Muskie program. And those of you who know the history of exchanges know what, a, what a very important that program that was uh, in the region. Uh, IREX also brought the internet to many people in the Soviet bloc um, at that very time. And so there is where you can see the roots of the IREX we have today. So flash forward to the present. We work globally. We work in more than 120 countries. We have offices in 22, more than 400 employees. And yes, IREX is still very much working to exchange people and ideas to promote understanding, as we did back in 1968. But we're also working to support civil society, cultivate rising leaders, extend access to quality education information, and engage and empower uh, youth all to promote more just, prosperous, and inclusive societies. So that's who we're proud to be today. We've changed a lot, but the, the ethos and the commitment goes back to the earliest days. Okay, so Kristen, talk about some examples of how IREX has used its uh, ability to bring people together or to run exchanges. Talk about um, some examples of, of how you've done that where it's had some strategic value. Yeah, and let me give three examples, and these are th all three where we cooperate actively with our friends at the State Department and also uh, USAID. And I think that these three are not just about IREX, they are about programs and how programs like this can advance direct strategic interests in the way that any, the most wonky of foreign policy or national security wonks can understand. So three quick examples. First of all, uh, we are proud to be part of a program that helps to bring between 100 and 100 30 secondary, so high school teachers from Pakistan to the United States every year to learn modern pedagogies, critical thinking, and generally also expose them to U.S. culture and values. I have personally sat next to high school teachers from the Fatah, from Baluchistan, who have never left their region, let alone uh, Pakistan, and here they are responsible for shaping the education in the minds of young people. You know, each teacher reaches hundreds of young people over their career. And so I think the return on this uh, investment for U.S. strategic interest is, is quite significant. Uh, another program, I'll give an example, uh, is the Thomas Jefferson Scholars Program. And this is a program that brings between 100 and 140, depending on the year, young Tunisians to the United States for either community college or a, a bachelor's degree, one year uh, mass, uh, bachelor's degree uh, program or undergraduate program in the United States. Then we, that they go back, they get supported by hooking them up with um, position employment opportunities, job skills, and so on. So let's keep in mind, Tunisia is the number one exporter of foreign troops to ISIS. Tunisia is a fledgling democracy in a very tumultuous region, and its success will have cascading effects across the entire region and be critical in the fight against violent extremism. The young people who are coming on this program have an unemployment rate, or have an employment rate well over 80% when the uh, unemployment rate in Tunisia for youth is well over 40%, and employers tell us they cannot hire enough of these people. I was just in Tunisia myself a couple of months ago, and employers are eager for these young people and see them as being keys to the future. More than 40% of the students in this pro program are coming from the most marginalized, most underserved communities in the country, so on the Libyan-Algerian borders. Um, these are rife with extremist recruiters, and here we have people who are spending time in the United States, studying and getting jobs, and then going back to their communities. They are not staying in Tina, Tunis, they are not moving to Europe, they are going back to their communities, and we see this consistently. Last example. The Young African Leaders Initiative, uh, Mandela Washington Fellows Program, again, IREX very, very proud to partner with U.S. government to run this program. Uh, we have had, as of this summer, we will have 3,700 
uh, alumni from every country in Sub-Saharan Africa in business and entrepreneurship, public management, and civic leadership positions. These are people who come age 25 to 35. They spend six weeks in the United States getting intensive executive training. They're an active network. We have, um, to just to give an example of the strategic value, we have more than 300 alumni just in Zimbabwe. Think about what that will mean when Zimbabwe changes. We have hundreds in Nigeria. Think about what that will mean. They're empowered, they have skills, they're networked, and they are very, very close friends of the United States, a, a position they've come to on their own through their own exposure. I'll just give those three examples, Dan. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so Lauren, uh, you are the president of the American Councils for International Education. Tell us a little bit about the American Councils for International Education. How did it get started? What was its original mission? And how did it evolve over time? Dan, thanks first of all for holding this session and thanks to your colleagues at CSIS. Um, we are the youngest organization here. We began as the, uh, a group of Council of Teachers of Russian um, that decided to do exchanges with essentially the Soviet Council of Teachers of English. This was back to the mid-1970s. Um, and we continued to do exchange work more and more and more throughout the Soviet Union until the fall of the wall when we moved into those constituent republics also to do exchanges. So now we're talking early 1990s. I'll come back to that in a second. Since then, we've expanded into Asia, South Asia, and the Middle East, um, always dealing with student exchanges all the way from high schoolers in the FLEX program that some of you are familiar with, all the way through college, master's degree, PhD, and professional level exchanges, now currently working in about 85 countries around the world with, again, a very dedicated staff. I've interviewed or talked to 161 of our DC staff, and I believe all but three of them did exchanges themselves. So they know the gift that they are giving, you know, the good of it, but they also know in week six you start to get homesick, so start calling around to all the students. Um, stories. I was in Uzbekistan, this was pre, but just to illustrate the power of exchanges, just after 9-11, it was the fall of 2001, and I was at a reception that John Herbst, who many of you know, was then the ambassador of Uzbekistan, was giving for me. And uh, this gentleman came up to me, he was about this tall, um, in brown robes, the whole nine yards, he was a mullah. And he began the conversation by saying to me, I want you to know I used to hate your country. And I thought that's a really good icebreaker. No. And I, I said, well, how do you feel now? He said, I like your country better. And I said, well, how come? And he said, because I got to visit your country. And I said, well, what was it about my country that you liked? And he said, well, you can do something in America I can't do here in Uzbekistan. And I said, what is that? And he said, in America, you can worship freely as a Muslim. And I thought, wow, he had been um, on one of the short exchange programs, probably cost $10,000 to bring him here. And I thought for that $10,000, how many 16 to 24 year old men is he gonna be talking to in this country who are talking about the great Satan? And he'll say, yes, but I can give you lots of examples like that amongst our graduates or many prime ministers and presidents, ambassadors, ministers, et cetera. And one of the things I always tell people is we have to be very, very selective given the limited USG funding we have for these programs. At American Councils of the folks overseas who are applying, and this is a limited pool to begin with, they know English, they wanna to come to America, they're real smart. Of that pool, we're taking between one in 20 and one in 40. That makes our programs tougher to get into than Harvard or Stanford. In fact, I just, I met a woman on the Hill who was accepted at Harvard, but she got rejected twice from our programs. Yeah. She doesn't bear us any ill will, fortunately. But the, my point is, these are people who are probably gonna succeed in their countries, whether they come to America or not. What they tell us is when they come here, they get a sense of independence, they get a sense of motivation, they get a sense of working in groups, they get a sense of community, of working to better your community. And in a lot of their countries, those are not valued commodities. The other thing they gain, because the vast majority have a very positive experience here in the US, 
I always say it doesn't necessarily make them love America, for many it does, but it certainly makes them understand America. And when we all were in the State Department, I'm sure we can all tell stories of the foreign diplomat we were gonna be negotiating with who said to us, I want you to know I spent six months in your country, I went to college in your country, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't mean they're gonna give us more negotiations, but it does mean that they understand why we're asking for certain things in negotiations. What is it about American society that makes us ask for those things? So that's why I think these programs are valuable. So I, I can see, Lauren, just turn off the, the microphone. So I can see why um, these were very valuable in the Cold War. But I, is there, a, can you each give a, in, in each of your answers you gave a little bit of a rationale as to why, but I suspect there are many folks in the Congress and maybe in the administration who will ask questions like, well, why are we still funding this stuff? Why do we, keep, why do we need to keep doing this? I could under, you could understand the geostrategic rationale during the Cold War. Could, what is the value of this today? Uh, and, and if you were in front of a, a congressional committee, what would your answer be to that question? If I could hear that from each of you, please. So just a couple for me. Um, first, the GDP that the United States controlled in the world in 1960, when these programs were created, was significant. We were the most dominant economy. We are no longer that. We need to have commercial, economic, social relationships, not just to show them how we do it, but basically to have these relationships for the benefit of our people, of the people who pay taxes, of the people who want to export, the people who want to um, create small businesses. This is this is really has a much more of an economic uh, imperative today than it did then. Um, secondly, it's no secret that radical ideologies have replaced, you know, the communist threat as our major strategic um, focus challenge in the world today. And that is a retail business. That is not a wholesale business. Yes, people can watch TV and be influenced by a television show and so forth, but it, it really is uh, getting a, a focus and I think, uh, you know, there were examples here from my colleagues about how that uh, person to person contact can have that ripple effect. And we, we are in a, a generational struggle. And I think uh, that's, that's the second reason. And you know, the third reason is with unpredictability in our relationships currently where we're not sure where people stand, having more threads and strands of relationship are important because those need to undergird the ebbs and flows of bilateral relationships, which will always be a function of the policy of the day. There have always been policy issues on the front page of the newspaper. But underneath that, if we don't have these programs, we're not going to have the leverage, we're not going to have the connections that we need as a country when we need them uh, for our own national interests. Okay. I didn't know what you mean by sort of the ebbs and flows, or however you described it, of sort of the, the moment. I, do you, I'll have to come back to you about that. That's a great term. So, okay, so Kristen, um, so how would you answer that question? It's a Navy thing. It's a Navy thing. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll get right down to brass tacks, because of course we could talk about the educational benefits, the exposure to new ideas, but you know, I think the Congress, rightly so, wants to see a really hard return on investment, so let me help with that. The th first thing is, I think we can see that building these kinds of relationships has a direct return for strategic interest, and I think the examples I gave of the Pakistani teachers, the young people from marginalized communities in Tunisia, and the rising African leaders from every country in the fastest growing continent in the world are a perfect example of that, and I'd be happy to unpack that in Q&A if we like. The second thing is, these things open opportunities for Americans. Even when foreigners are coming here, we see that the contacts they make are actually opening real opportunities. And there's a great example of a Mandela Washington fellow from Angola who went to study in the, the Midwest. They wanted to buy more corn. Iowa's got lots of corn. Uh, you know, then th this is actually helping to hopefully open an export market for US farmers in the middle of the country. 
A third example is, let's talk about return on investment in terms of investing in people for a very small amount who can have impact for years to come. So yes, I talked about the teachers and the government leaders who go into positions of power, um, but let's also think about media professionals. When we're teaching people through exchange programs, uh, like the one we run with the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs in Georgia and Ukraine, we're, ta we're teaching independent news outlets in a part of the world that's pretty much bombarded by propaganda and disinformation to be more effective in engaging media consumers, more cost effective and effective as a business so they can be sustained on their own, and just generally how to run a more professional, more up-to-date institution that's going to be able to compete with flows of misinformation and propaganda. And then the last thing I'll say, just in terms of return on investment, I mean, we're not even talking about change under the soda machine in the Pentagon. We're talking about the lint on under the change under the soda machine in the Pentagon. And you know, I'm in favor of a strong defense. I actually have a na strong national security background. My PhD is on the causes of war. But if we're looking at dollar for dollar what you're getting, you know, I think the return on investment is really extraordinary. And we do tend to hold exchanges to, a, I think, too high of a level in terms of showing impact. I am in favor of the billions and billions and hundreds of billions of dollars we spend on a strong deterrent uh, force in Asia. If we ask, show me what each marginal million, or what the heck, 100 million or billion, what each dollar of that money investment is getting in terms of actual outcome for deterrence, it's just very hard to show. It doesn't mean it's not having an impact, but we want to somehow show that every dollar of the pittance we spend on exchanges is having a return on investment in a way that I think far exceeds the bar that we're holding all of our other foreign policy instruments to in terms of a standard. Uh, so I named a few. I could keep going, but Lauren will also want you, to- You'll see your time. <laughs> <laughs> so Lauren, if you were, so if this was a, if you were in front of a, a congressional committee and they asked you, what's the value of this? What's your answer to that? If if you had said on 9-10-2001, where's the next threat to the U.S. going to come from? I don't think many people would have said Afghanistan. And I don't think many people would have seen the need to have good relations with countries in Central Asia or a country like Pakistan. We now think it could be China, maybe Russia, we're not sure. We thought it was China in the summer of 2001. You never know where the next issue is going to come from. And that's why it's important to cast a wide net for these programs over the long term. And there's, as you all know, there is a difference between asking an ally for help when you haven't talked to them for a while and asking an ally for help when you have good relationships with them, like the kind of classic example of a foreign pol uh, policy president Herbert Walker had. He spent time investing in those relationships. And then when we needed help, people were there to give it. We need to continue investing in these relationships. Some of these relationships, like, I've had, like I said, are from the 1990s. The people who came here are now presidents and prime ministers in those countries, and they have not forgotten what America was like and what motivated America. So I think it's important to cast a wide net and continue the programs. Second thing is we're having competition for these programs. Uh, if you look at a chart of what percentage of students in a country are from abroad, you probably couldn't guess, but the UK's number one, it's 21%, we're about 5%. Russia is investing, they have tripled their, um, they're looking to triple by the year 2025, the number of foreign students they're bringing in to Russia to study fully paid. Uh, the Chinese have gone up 10 times in the last 18 years, the number of students they are looking to, they have brought into their country, and they're looking to bring more, a lot from Asia, but also from countries like Africa. So we need to stay in that game to make sure that five or 10 or 15 years from now, if we need help out there, if we need some cooperation, we know who to call in those countries. Okay, so, so Lauren, it just I, I studied abroad in Spain. I think um, many other people studied abroad. Is do you get a lot of students raising their hands and saying, "I really want to go to Kazakhstan"? How do you, how do you get folks to go there, and how do you what role do you play in getting American students to study in places that are a little bit let's call it off the beaten track? 
this is why you need organizations like ours and you need federal spending, spending like this. If you look at where American students who go through university or college programs are going overseas, almost half of them of the students going overseas go to five countries, the UK, Spain, France, Italy, and Germany. There are not many colleges and universities that say, hey, we've got a program in Kazakhstan. Would you like to go there? Or we've got a program in Bangladesh. And again, it's not that our Western European friends and allies, and they are friends and allies, that we don't need to keep up relations with them. But we also need to have relations with these countries that are a little further afield. It's not a high volume or a lot of people that really want to spend their time in Kazakhstan, spend a year there, or in Indonesia. I, I'm sorry, Astana is a really nice city, and I uh, let me just stand I don't up want for to my insult, friends, the I don't Kazakhs, want to insult but... Astana. <laughs> it is a lovely place. Um, but there are enough people who are advancing in their academic careers, undergrads, uh, in grad school, and doing their PhDs, um, that you can take a small cadre every year to some of these countries that aren't London or Paris. Yeah, that. It's a tough call, London or Astana. Yeah. I know it's a tough call, but, but I do think we need a cadre of people who know these countries well enough. All, we need someone who knows all these. We know to, enough people who know each of these countries. OK, let me ask Kristen and Stu, Ambassador Holiday the, the question about, let's call, it, let's call it the competition for influence. So could you each comment, if I use the term competition for influence, and, and, and Lauren has raised this a little bit, could you just reflect it? If I say that to you, what's your reaction to that that term? You're welcome. Oh, yes. um, I, I think that the the statistics that Lauren gave are perfect examples of how very savvy players on the geopolitical scene see exchange programs and leadership development programs as strategic investment. There is a reason why the Chinese and the Russian are, are using their resources to expand these kinds of programs. And I think in the United States, we're so used to the attractive power of the United States and our our institutions of higher education that we've almost taken it for granted. Um, I think we will do this at our peril. The Young African Leaders Initiative, Mandela Washington Fellowship Program, last year, if memory serves, we had 38,000 applicants for a program that could take 700. So these are people who are not kids who go, want to go on a trip. These are people aged 25 to 35 with jobs and families who are taking a significant amount of time away from their homes in order to do a really rigorous program in the United States. That kind of attractive power is a, something we ought to be cognizant of. It's something we ought to see how much some other major geopolitical players would like to be able to do something like that. And we ought to remember that this is something that needs sustained investment and attention because it is a huge strategic asset, but it's an asset that we can't neglect or it will decline. There is competition. Just speaking on behalf of Meridian, um, we take a sort of two-track approach to this question, which is one is we have a lot of um, bilateral exchange work with China, particularly in the cultural arena. We were part of the strategic economic dialogue. We believe in engagement with China, um, particularly in the secondary cities and further away from the coast where people may not have as clear an understanding about the United States. So we think that's good. But in other parts of the world, as was mentioned, um, we run the counterpart to the Young African Leaders Program in uh, Latin America and the Western Hemisphere for entrepreneurs. And we, we do a lot of work in Africa. And, and it's really great to hear why America is viewed differently. And a lot of it is because of the investment in human capital and human potential that is there. So when, we're, when, when people think about American um, presence or, or our exchange programs or our programs, they, they really think that they, are, um, that they have potential for them personally, not just for a corporation or not just for the government. And that's very important and I think that gives us uh, an advantage. So could you, could you each talk about how the, we've talked about how the business has evolved, I'll call it a business, it has evolved since the 50s and how each of your organizations has adopted or changed with the times. Could you just fast forward 10, 15, or 20 years and say, okay, how is, 
how, how, could you just think a little bit about how, how is your business going to change over the next 15 year, 20 years on sort of the use of exchanges? If we continue to believe there is a value for this, what are the kinds of things you're going to, you think that you're starting to see now that you're going to see a lot more of? What are the kinds of things that you're doing now that you may see less of? Maybe start with you, Ambassador Holliday. Sure. Well, how they've changed, of course, is a reflection of, of society and where power is, which is we, we do a lot more with the private sector today than Meridian ever did. Uh, we have a, a lot of exchanges that we do on behalf of and with private sector partners. Um, so I think that's one piece. Uh, the second piece is the, the, the true two-way exchange. Uh, in other words, an exchange where there is um, reciprocity uh, and mutual value versus just a one-way street. So having that American counterpart gain, you know, benefit uh, and, and have those connections in those countries uh, as well. And the third thing going forward, I would say, instead of looking at these participants as just alumni like you would a college, I mean, I really get back to this question of communities of interest, which is, how can we use technology and the power of exchange and to combine them so that these networks of people, whether they're working on environmental issues, whether they're journalists, whether they're uh, people that are um, looking at entrepreneurship, whatever the subject is, how can we uh, preserve those networks so that they can be used uh, going forward? And I think, I think we can all do a better job. Uh, it, it, technology changes all the time, but the principle is it's getting much more accessible to people. And it's being used. My son you know, spends several hours a day playing a game called Fortnite, oh, which God. has taken over my house. But he plays with his uh, you know, uh, 30 friends. And um, I, I don't know why there couldn't be you know, 30 uh, young leaders, 15 from America, 15 from pick a country, working on um, pandemic disease. And, and why? Because they met on an exchange program. They forged that, tr that level of trust, and that they could continue to work together. So I'd like to see more of that going forward. I'm sorry, I've just been triggered, Ambassador Holiday, by the Boy, word Fortnite. Fortnite. I hate Fortnite. It's <laughs> causing all sorts of conflict in my home. Ugh, thumbs down on Fortnite. Okay, Kristen, over to you. <laughs> all right, message received. Um, I don't play Fortnite. Okay, good. Um, I've heard of Fortnite. Um, but I'll talk about a couple of things I think we're likely to see and a couple of things I would like to see. Um, a couple of things that are likely to see. Uh, look, IREX is an organization who has changed its work based on the strategic interests of the United States. The, uh, the State Department is a very close partner of ours. And as US strategic interests have evolved, so have IREX programs and other exchange programs. And I expect that to continue. And that makes a lot of sense if we are investing the taxpayers' money. So I, I, I expect to see continued change of that sort. Another change we've seen and I expect to continue is that these programs increasingly do not just serve the elites. You know, we work so hard to, for the Mandela Washington Fellows Program to get outside the capitals and recruit people who are not the children of elites and people who are leaders in the hinterlands um, with programs like the Pakistan Exchange Program I mentioned, the Teacher Exchange. We're really getting to the Fatah, Baluchistan, elsewhere. Um, we're really looking at marginalized populations and people who are able to lead and go back to those uh, populations, that's not as common in the past, but I think it's much, much needed in the future as power decentralizes, and, and frankly, that's where we're seeing a lot of the, the challenges and extremism arise. Um, two things I would like to see. Um, IREX doesn't run exchange programs with Russia anymore, um, and I really think that's a shame. We ran exchange programs with Russia, the Soviet Union, during the entire Cold War. It was not done naively. It was done with competition in mind, and there were a lot of tensions at those times. But we both recognized that it was in our mutual strategic interest to have channels of communication and understanding, people in both of our countries who deeply understood the other. Those programs have dramatically declined. Um, and I have a, Paul Saunders and I have a recent piece in the national interest calling for the return of investments in those kinds of programs. Um, I don't see the US government finding that, funding that any time soon, unfortunately. But 
but it is something that I think we really, really need, and it would be very far-sighted. Um, and the last thing I'll say is another uh, what's old is uh, is new again category. You know, IREX had largely left a lot of the programs we had been in in Eastern Europe, and suddenly we find ourselves expanding our offices in Ukraine, reopening our offices in Serbia, uh, focusing even more on journalist education once again uh, for all the reasons that people in this room will know. I would like to see us double down on some of those investments and recognize that, you know, it's not like, isn't the new Incredibles? I hope the Incredibles is an okay reference no, like with you, Dan. Incredible. Okay, the new Incredibles movie is coming out. And the first one, Mr. Incredible says, why won't the world just stay saved? Um, and I think there is a tendency with U.S. foreign policy and exchange programs that once we sort of build relationships and things are going well, we sort of hang up the mission accomplished uh, uh, sign and, and pack up and move out. Um, but I think the last several years have been an all too poignant reminder that the world doesn't stay saved and we're going to need to stay in, stay engaged, and that we'll be better off for the long term. I'd say two things, a little bit related to technology, and I don't think my kids are playing that game, but I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask them tonight. Exactly. Uh, I came out of a world, I, previously I used to work at the International Republican Institute working on political processes, and you could see at that time, just like the, you know, in many ways our system used to be just the elites and now the authorities being pushed down and spread out, you can see that in other countries. So I think it is, we make an effort, as, as do uh, my colleagues, to get outside the capitals and find candidates for our programs who are not in the best schools in the country, but they're the best students, uh, some of the best students in their country. I think we ought to be able to use technology to do some pre-work with them more and more. If you're in a village in eastern Ukraine somewhere, it may not occur to you to come on an exchange and come to America for a year. Likewise, um, in this country, one of the things we've been trying to do uh, over the past year especially and I know, again, all of our organizations do it, is if you're uh, of a particular background, you really, a lot of you may not, a lot of those people may not think of going on exchanges. For example, 32% of our country is Latin, Latin American background or uh, African American background. 21% of our four-year college grads are of those two backgrounds. Uh, Latinos and African Americans form 14% of exchange students. Now, I worked at the State Department, and we all did a couple times. Uh, if you look at the Foreign Service Generalist category, which is the basic Foreign Service, only 10% are Latino or, his, or uh, African American. And I keep thinking about the time 20 or 25 years from now when America is less than half white. Is our Foreign Service going to continue to be 10% Latino and African American? And what we're doing, we're, I know I'm the stereotype of what international study does. I did it twice when I was a kid, and it really got me into the international field. Doesn't mean everybody that goes on an exchange is going to join the Foreign Service or the NSA or the CIA or whatever, but a large number do. And I think we all have a duty as time moves forward to reach out more and more uh, to people from those backgrounds that might not normally think of doing that, representing their country in a corporate, in a corporation, or in the Foreign Service, or even in academia. But I think we have a duty to do more of that. OK. All right, you all been very patient. I'd love to hear. I know there's some very thoughtful people here. So why don't you raise, raise, hand, raise hands, please? Okay, we have microphones? Okay, so here's how we're gonna do this though. So I have a very particular way of doing this because we wanna be inclusive. So if you take more than 30 seconds, you're being uninclusive to the rest of the people who wanna speak and you don't wanna be uninclusive. So I want y'all to think they're long and hard before you go on and get, give a long peroration with your time. So it's name, organization, and a very short comment. And after 30 seconds, I'm gonna start you know, going like this, or please stop. And Just ask stop. him a question about Fortnite, please. Right, right. And ask me a question about Fortnite, and I'll give you an answer. <laughs> okay, so come on up here. Uh, Joseph, 
So my friend here, my friend here, this gentleman here, and this gentleman here. So we'll start with those four, and we're going to bunch them together. So again, being inclusive. Good afternoon, Ambassador and the rest. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Rosemary Segera. I'm a president of Segeros International Group. I've been talking to Yamamoto, Ambassador Yamamoto, the same thing we are talking. How does he, how can we include civil society when Ambassador Rex was going to, a secretary was going to Kenya? I said, you need to include the civil society, go with the secretary to their country. I speak Swahili, Rex doesn't speak Swahili. So that inclusion makes a great impact. We always have the webinar with him whenever there is uh, something going on on Africa, the State Department. And I was part of the YALI uh, recruiting. I reviewed the YALI 2013, and most of them came to the African, African summit, African USA summit uh, during President of the African leadership. So, how do we engage ourselves uh, working with you for a better, you know? Uh, exchange program and looking at now the technology, now that the technology is coming, how do you think, are you going to be doing this more or what? And All right, good. that's it. That's great. Thank you so much. And then we'll have the, the, my friend back here. Sherry Mueller, American University. Thank you for a very stimulating panel and I'm so glad to see you addressing it. How do we cultivate more champions on the Hill? Ambassador Holliday, you mentioned Congressman Royce, who's terrific, but he's retiring. And some of the other Republicans, you know, are, are going too. And some of us in this room were lucky enough to know Senator Fulbright, Senator Simon, others. How do we cultivate new champions on the Hill? Uh, Tom Timberg, consultant. Uh, I wondered how the uh, restrictions on visas uh, are affecting both your programs, but of course more the 1.2 million uh, foreign students which the uh, introduction refer, uh, referred to who do constitute the overwhelming majority of uh, exchanged persons. Okay, and there was someone else over here. Okay, so we'll take these four. Thank you, uh, Daniel Stoll, Georgetown University. And um, all of your organizations, I think at some point had dealt um, with exchanges involving the Soviet Union, China, Cold War engagement. Um, what, if anything, are you planning to do with North Korea? Okay, civil society, very important to engage on, uh, and I think that's what's great about the United States, is we're, we're not just going with the people in power when we run these programs, but we're investing in the spectrum. And I think that's, that's critically important. On North Korea, um, we explored a few years ago doing something in, along the border with China and trying to use that as a place to, to you know, explore. It wasn't possible then. I'm expecting, depending on how tomorrow goes, uh, maybe something could be possible, but I still think it's going to be, uh, a, you know, a challenge. Um, with, with respect to, let's see, the third was visas. visas. That really hasn't affected us too much other than a public diplomacy, uh, you know, something that, that doesn't make us look great in the world, but in terms of our programs, um, the embassies have, they've been delays uh, for us. Um, we've had to delay or postpone, but, but they've all been granted either waivers or been able to come on the programs. And there was a fourth? Congress. Champions, Champions of the Hill, oh, perfect question. Well, Mark Rebstock is sitting right behind you, your former colleague, he's our head of, uh, vice president for advocacy. He's we gonna solve this. To, first of all, we, we do have champions on the Hill, thank goodness. Um, I think two things. One is working the local angle, as you have in terms of these uh, local organizations uh, like Global Ties and the different councils that have relationships in their districts. And second is we've been exploring you know, orientation sessions for newly elected members of Congress to sort of walk through 
these different programs and why they're beneficial. And I think that's a, they're they are so busy, we think that, you know, to get their attention, you have to go up there and you have to do things on the Hill, which is important. But really working the local angle, continuing to engage them here and, and looking at what is their focal point of interest and how do you align your story with that. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for your help with the Mandela Washington Fellows Program. And I completely agree, engaging civil society both here in the U.S. and when dignitaries, uh, U.S. officials are traveling makes perfect sense. I will just, to add something more useful than just saying thank you and I agree, I will say that one challenge that nonprofits have is absorptive capacity and bandwidth to do this. Engaging civil society well takes intentionality and time, and this is something that requires resources, and so we need to keep figuring out ways to do this efficiently and well, because that is an obstacle to what would we all know would enrich our programs. Um, on the visa issue, we're not personally being affected too much right now, um, but I will point to a couple of things I am seeing uh, beyond IREX as well as. First, there's already been a demonstrable decline in international students and therefore dollars invested in the United States that's been documented. The Wall Street Journal has done some good reporting on this, and I do think that's a worry. The thing I'm also hearing a lot in my own travels that I'm not sure is on the radar screen is fear of violence. You know, um, um, people around the world are seeing college students, um, high school students being shot. And I, this has come up so many places, whether I've been in Latin America or in India or in the Middle East. I mean, people are actually scared to come here, Pakistan. You know, people are scared to come here because they think it's dangerous. And we did unfortunately just see this young Pakistani student in the YES program shot in Texas. Um, there was this incident in um, uh, the Midwest where an Indian was uh, attacked, and I was in India at the time. So I think that this is one of the major um, things that we're not really paying enough attention to. And you know, it's not that we don't have a big problem in this country. We do. It is so inflated in some of the media, sometimes intentionally by foreign governments, that that is something I really worry about for investment, for study, you name it. Um, North Korea, um, we would do not feel it would be safe or legal to engage with uh, North Korea at this time, um, and we abide by the law very scrupulously. Um, hope all our friends in the government caught that. Um, but you know, if if one day when those sanctions are lifted and opening comes, yeah, we have an we have a deep experience working in countries that have been close to the United States where there've been animosities, and we would love to do that, but only you know when we had the full support of the U.S. government. And lastly, on Sherry's question, so I'm on the board of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. We are talking with people on the Hill all the time, and this is what I hear constantly, and everyone here can help. Members of Congress don't need to hear from anyone in this room very much, although you know you two are great spokesmen, so keep it up. Um, they really want to hear from people in their districts. Um, so one thing we're doing at IREX when we have groups visiting, um, like the Mandela Washington Fellows, is we have them go with their local interlocutors at local universities. We encourage them to go and meet with their members in the districts. With USGLC and with IREX, we really encourage the students, the business people, who are support the veterans who support these programs in their district to engage with remember there. Frankly, that's who members need to hear from in order to win them over. And also, it really helps when they travel. So if people are hearing from their districts that they should travel and when they go, they will meet people who have spent time and engaged in the United States. They will see for themselves the benefit. So we think we just have to really keep bringing it home. Um, and I don't have the statistics on the top of my head. Maybe you gentlemen do. But there are so many more new members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Um, than we've had in past years. You know, the percentage of new people is so high. We've just got to really be diligent about making it real for those people. A couple of things real quick, not to repeat anything anybody else said. On North Korea, I think that would be really interesting and important. I was uh, in government when we started, before we had relations with Vietnam, started bringing young Vietnamese uh, over to the U.S. and they went through Georgetown. And now Vietnam's certainly not a democracy, but they're very high up in the government and they understand the US. Um, it, it could be we've had people from other countries and they were engaged in movements when they went home. The Hill's gonna be a real challenge. Um, I would not take a lot of solace from the fact that the Hill has now three times basically rejected uh, drastic administration proposals for reductions 
on exchanges. Uh, they, they have done so in part because of the people you mentioned and others who are going to be leaving, like Charlie Dent and Ileana Rosslight, and I'm not sure how much longer John McCain will be around, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to be replaced by freshmen, many of whom are not going to know about these programs. And I have found, somewhat to my surprise, going up there about 50 times over the last 11 months, that the highfalutin arguments about U.S. strategic interests do get you a certain distance. But when you can say, here's how many people we brought into your district and here's about how much they spent. Oh, and by the way, we took this many people from your district to Kazakhstan or Tajikistan or wherever, that that's when they get really, really interested. So we need to really make a big push on the hill with the new people, and as Kristen said, make sure they understand it's in their district's interest to be doing this kind of thing. Okay, I can take a couple more. Okay, uh, this woman here and this, this, uh, this woman here as well, these two. Hi, I'm Sarah Dorr. Um, I work with the Los Angeles Community College District and I'm a doctoral student at Loyola Marymount. Um, on the side of students, American students going abroad, I'm curious what your organizations are doing, especially given that there's a climate of increasing sort of insular xenophobia, I think, in, um, in this country, hopefully not as much among students, but it scares me sometimes to think that some of the only Americans people in especially more remote places overseas will ever meet are young American students who may not know much about cultural diplomacy or even worse, military, young military people who are essentially doing the work of development people who haven't really been taught these things either. So I'm wondering if your organizations do anything in that area of training people who are going from us. Okay, to thank you. This woman back here, and then I wanna hear from N Northern Virginia Community College over here. So th this person then Northern Virginia Community College, please. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Helen. Um, I'm a just recently returned Peace Corps China volunteer, but um, I actually was a critical language scholarship um, alum, and then wonderful. I was alumni ambassador, and I also used to read for Yali. So You're welcome, right? Very, so I really can empathize that um, I have benefited from it, and I have also helped facilitate, um, and I'm really thankful to be here. But my question is actually a little bit following up on that. Um, when I was serving in China and then Indonesia for CLS, um, when I tried to promote uh, these exchange organizations, the, the reciprocity that we talked about, um, I found that sometimes, more often than not, administrators would really try to subvert these recruitment and implementation um, efforts and ultimately prohibit uh, potential uh, applicants from applying. Uh, and it usually came from much higher up, especially in China. like. When we were talking about Fulbright or any other kind of exchanges, administrators, administrators would hear from higher up, higher up, higher up that the government didn't want um, professional colleagues or students to get U.S. funding. So what do we do about that in terms of countries that say, yes, we want to partner with you, but actually are subverting efforts to uh, facilitate this exchange? Thank you. And okay, then Nor the, oh, yeah, Rob Henderson at Northern Virginia Community College. Okay. Rob Henderson, Northern Virginia Community College. Um, you know, in dire times, sometimes you have to think a little bit outside the box to address some of the issues. What about DOD funding? Uh, you're talking about the lint in the bottom of the pocket uh, over in the bottom of the change drawer over there in, uh, in, the, in the Pentagon. And, and the issue is not whether, uh, you know, they've got the money. It's the issue is, has this sector of our array of strategic assets that you people represent have you given thought to maybe a little closer collaboration? For example, in the areas of foreign language training, we know that uh, heritage language trainers are just, you know, people who speak a heritage language and come out of one of these critical language areas are the prime repository of our, of our national talent for translation services, for communication, for cross-cultural communication and, and an array of things. That's just one sector. What about some of the other sectors? It was mentioned earlier about, uh, uh, you know, how do we tap, how could, is there a possibility? All right, let me add a question, um, which is I, I think we're not still producing enough uh, language speakers in, in oddball but strategic languages, you, and I think you know what I'm trying to say. So could you each talk about how do you, how, if at all, does your organization touch on the issue of, let's call it, uh, strategic, um, off the beaten path, but strategic languages, if you could each just, t to the extent that, 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 that comes across your radar screen. Okay, Ambassador Holly. 
Okay, most of these questions are really outside the purview of my organization. We don't send students uh, abroad, but on the question of DOD funding, I know that Secretary Clinton and Secretary Gates at one point talked about that, and there was a willingness by Secretary Gates to try to look for areas of cooperation and, and shared programmatic uh, opportunities, but the, the Congress ultimately said, no, that's not really, you know, you can't do that without having it go through the different appropriations. So it's a, it's really a, you know, a legislative issue. Um, obviously, we know the, the the Department of Defense does a lot of exchanges. They have the Marshall Centers. They have the you know, East West Center. There's a lot of, um, a lot of programs they run. But it would be great, obviously, to have uh, more resources for these programs. I'm going to defer the student questions to my colleagues. Kristen. Yeah, we also don't do uh, much to send American students overseas, so I can't answer those questions. One thing we do uh, do, though, that I, I wanted to flag uh, in cooperation with our friends at the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs is to work on training U.S. teachers and to teach in about the world, to teach what we call global competencies, which are giving students skills they need to interact with other cultures, people from around the world. And that is one way of having a high return on investment, um, more of a, a a wholesale strategy versus a retail strategy to give students some of those skills. You know, one teacher will reach hundreds or thousands over the course of a career. And so, you know, I think if in a world of limited resources, there's, there's definitely a role for that kind of program. Um, with respect to uh, the question about Defense Department, I mean, my personal experience, and again, I have a national security background, is that the military, Secretary Mattis in particular, and other senior leaders, they're huge champions of these programs. They directly benefit. Um, but as Stuart said, they don't have the, the ability to move funds to support them. They can be advocates, but that's sort of putting them in an awkward position. Um, and it doesn't look great internationally. So we somehow need our Congress to find a way out of this puzzle palace where the military actually loves and wants these programs, but legally can't put the money there and we don't really want to send the message around the world that our exchange programs are being driven by our military so we kind of just need uh, we kind of just need the Congress I think to step up and deal with that but you know always welcome um, friendly support from our, our colleagues in uniform and what was the third question Critical languages. Languages. Oh, critical languages. Yeah, we don't do too much on, on this either. But I will, I, I will say that one thing we do is sometimes uh, for critical languages, we have a new program where we're arranging some study tours to help people who are not actually majors in that language to get some exposure. Because one of the things you see is, you know, just because somebody's not studying a critical um, language as their full-time course of study doesn't mean for heritage reasons or other reasons they may not be interested, they may not have learned that language at home. Uh, may have studied it elsewhere, um, but maybe their actual main degree is in business or law or public policy. And so I would say that I think there are a lot of opportunities, not just to have more in-depth programs on critical languages, which we definitely need for a national security perspective, but also to give people in that next category down who could be bridges and have the, the language but don't have the exposure or the connections, to just sort of tip them over the edge and help them to make that connection and get that personal experience, because experience really matters. Okay, Lauren. On the training for U.S. students going abroad, we usually do about a week's orientation for them. And one of the, you know, one of the things we really emphasize is you may be the only American that folks you're going to interact with overseas ever meet. So their impression of America will be their impression of you. Um, the programs that we run, at least, most of the students who go overseas are living with a host family. They are not clustered in a dorm and going down to Planet Hollywood, if there is a Planet Hollywood in their town. Um, and that, I think, brings it to them very, very quickly that you need to understand the local customs and the local mores. There is actually a DOD-funded program that we do call the flagship program, which handles about, I believe it's right now, nine what are considered strategically important languages. It's not a huge program. Um, but we run programs, I'm about to head over in July to Meknes, Morocco. Um, we fund program, we fund people to go over and study Mandarin, uh, Russian, Arabic, et cetera, et cetera. It's about nine languages right now. I do think given the nature of what it has fallen to the Defense Department to do, if you look at places like Western Africa, 
that they ought to be a little, they should be thinking more about what they can do uh, via exchanges and via changing things, helping folks in the country to change things. I think DOD would profit from that. We've got to end it here. Please join me in thanking the panelists. <laughs>